Just a pleasure to be here with you today. We are going to talk a little bit about the brain. Brain training, how we, how we train, specifically how Jesus was training the brains of his disciples. I'd like to start, um, actually, let's read, starting in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 40. I'd like to actually read this together, if we can put it up on the screen. Let's just read together. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Wonderful. I love that passage. Have you ever felt that you were in the middle of a storm and Jesus was asleep? Maybe you're in the middle of a storm now. Maybe it's a economic storm, a number of us are in that situation, a a physical storm, a relational storm, and you've been praying or you've been, I mean, you're sure that Jesus is there, you've been coming to church, but it just seems like he's asleep. This is actually a a very interesting passage from a number of of points of view, but I want to suggest to you that Jesus is doing something here He's actually training them. You can learn a lot of things with a DVD or you can learn a lot of things by coming to church or or in school, but training the way your brain receives it most efficiently is in the moment, is when you are facing that difficulty, that panic situation, what are you going to do? You notice they don't train our our forces in a movie theater by showing them uh, movies about the war. They have them out there. They have live ammo uh, demonstrations. They're training them in the moment. So Jesus is here with his disciples, and they're headed to the other side. He's given them some instructions. Now, what do these boats look like? It's sort of interesting. Can we put up a a picture of that uh, so this is sort of a, one of the boats that they would have used 2,000 years ago to get across the Sea of Galilee. First, they probably would use the sail, but then somebody would need to row. It's not an aluminum boat. It's a, it's a heavy wooden boat. And when you have 12 guys, and they said they took Jesus with them, 13 guys in this boat, this boat is riding very low. So it wouldn't really surprise you that when the storm comes up, water is actually coming into the boat. It's interesting what they say to Jesus. First of all, they have a lot of fear because that's something that Jesus addresses. But they say, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care? Isn't that how we feel when, when we're in our situation and God's not coming through for us, things aren't going our way? It's like he doesn't care. And we really need to take things into our own hands and make this work out because obviously either he's asleep or he doesn't care. When Jesus wakes up, There's two things that he says to them. He says, why were you so afraid and have you no faith? Have you still no faith? 
So the first thing that happens to our brains when we have a situation that we are overwhelmed, we haven't, we haven't experienced this particular situation before. Your brain keeps a library of all your experiences and perhaps things you've seen on movies or videos. But in a situation like this, you look through the library. We've got water coming into a boat. We've got 13 guys in here. I, I don't know what to do. Then we have fear. We have panic. Fear is actually not coming from your conscious mind. It's actually below the consciousness. For those techies or science geeks, it's the amygdala. It's the, it's the, it's the fear center. And so deep within you comes this fear. Or we may call it worry or other things at lower levels, anxiety. But, but these, these guys were in a panic. What happens when we get into fear? The first thing is generally our relational circuits shut down. You're no longer relational. That person next to you or in front of you or beside you, they are not a person to relate to. They are either a resource or they are an obstacle. They're in my way. You're in my way. I have to get out of here. You're in a, think about it. You're in traffic. You're late for your meeting. That person in front of you is an obstacle. They're not a person, right? You want them out of your way. So they're not relational. Even with Jesus, now he, he's a resource. He's not, the, the relationship's not there. He's just a resource. Don't you care that we're perishing? It, it's all about getting me out of this situation. And we can understand that. that I mean, I've been seasick a few times on the, uh, on the water, in, in airplanes. It's not fun to be there. So you add, you add a little bit of sickness to your panic and you're overwhelmed. But in a few moments, we're going to look at another passage where, where they're in a boat again on the water. And that's why I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus is actually training them here. He wants them to react with faith. Now, we talked a little bit bit about fear. Fear is usually a chemical response. It's your brain, which is an overload, sends a signal to your adrenal glands to release adrenaline and cortisol and a number of of chemicals, which, which make you want to run or fight or do something quickly to get yourself out of the situation. And what is faith? What is he asking them? Well, faith is is three things, as I understand it. It is it is a belief in something. It requires a knowledge of God. And then it requires risk. Belief, a knowledge of God, and some risk. So whenever I read a passage like this and I see that Jesus is sort of reprimanding them, I always ask the question, well, what did he want them to do? Right? I mean, this is very nice. He calms the storm. What, what was he expecting? Well, the first thing we need to do in any situation where we are in fear is to stay relational. Stay relational with God and stay relational with other people. It's very hard to do unless you train for it. Because when you start treating people as obstacles or objects or resources, you are not life giving to them. You are taking from them. You are manipulating them. And as I read The scriptures, Jesus is always about life giving. He's always giving something and he wants you to do the same thing. When I was in the hospital, I've been working for seven years and I was very nice to my patients. They would have said I was a very nice doctor, but I I would never have prayed with them because that involved a risk. 
See, I had belief, I had a knowledge of God, but I didn't want to take any risk. Well, that could cost me something. Somebody might criticize me. Somebody might complain. I could lose something. I could lose some respect. What if, what if somebody was offended? What if they thought I didn't know what I was doing? Because that's why I had to say a prayer. <laughs> <sighs> And for a neurosurgeon who's been in school 15 years after high school, that's uh, that's a lot to lose. And yet I realized one day that all of those excuses that I had were just kind of protecting me from taking a risk. And that it was time to take a risk. And I remember walking up to the preoperative area with the patients there. And I came up to the patient. There was just those little thin curtains between the, uh, the, the gurneys waiting to go to surgery. And I checked to make sure nobody was listening on both sides. <laughs> and I came up to Mrs. Jones and, and started, started talking to her. Her two daughters were there. We started talking about the surgery. And I'm feeling this sort of fear Right, your your gut gets tight, your mouth gets dry, your um, your speech is sort of pressured, and I'm not sure when I'm going to sort of sneak in this prayer. But I wasn't going to do it as long as the nurse was there, and there was a nurse that kept sort of milling around her, and I mean this is a top secret situation. I, I wasn't going to pray in front of a nurse, <laughs> so I'm I'm waiting and I'm waiting. Well, she doesn't leave, and so I finally I said, okay, I'll have to pray another day. I just didn't, I just, I went back to the nurse's station, and I pretended to be on the telephone. You know how you do sometimes when you're, I kept looking over, just <laughs> checking my pager. I'm very busy doctor, I'm busy doctor. Finally, the nurse left, I hung up the phone, I started walking over there, he, here came the anesthesiologist. I had another page, I got another page. So I'm waiting and waiting all the time, this fear, you know, pretty soon they're going to come and take her away to surgery. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to do this at some point. Finally, the anesthesiologist left. I hung up the phone. I walked up to her. I really hadn't thought of what to say, but I just sort of blurted it out. Well, uh, Mrs. Jones, I saw on her face sheet that she'd listed Protestant there. So I thought at least she's heard of prayer, I would hope. Would, would you like to say a prayer before your surgery? And she looked at her daughters. They looked at her and shrugged their shoulders and said, sure, okay. So I, I walked up to her and I thought about putting my hand on her shoulder. But neurosurgeons are not very touchy-feely. We generally prefer to touch people when they're under general anesthesia. <laughs> With a very sharp scalpel covered with a blue drape, painted sterilely. <laughs> Nonetheless, I saw people do that, so I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, uh, God, thank you for Mrs. Jones. You made the vessels in her brain and you can help me to repair them. And I ask you for wisdom and for skill and for success in this surgery. In Jesus' name, amen. And I took my hand off her shoulder and I looked at her and she had tears running down her face as did her two daughters I thought, wow that's a lot of um, power and it's a lot of emotion for a neurosurgeon to handle all at once all these women crying so I said I did what surgeons do with that kind of emotion I um, I patted her on the hand I just left it for the nurse to deal with and so I took off <laughs> She came in with her Kleenex and I hit the automatic door switch. Out I went. And you know, I had more joy at that surgery than I had ever had at any previous surgery in my life. And I believe the reason I had so much joy was people come to me as if I'm a god or demigod or something like that. And for the first time... I was honest. I said, you may think that I'm God, but I'm not. But I would be glad to talk to him with you if you're interested. 
That level of authenticity, that level of honesty freed me. That's the truth. The truth is whatever people think, uh, no matter how well you're trained, how much schooling, it doesn't matter. You, you know that I don't control everything, and, and, and so do I. But if I pretend that it's all me, that puts a lot more pressure on me. And so I had more joy at that, at that operation than I'd had before. And I saw her, her daughters afterwards. The surgery went well, and they thanked me for praying for their mother. It gave her such peace, they said. And so I, ever since that time, virtually everyone that I do surgery on, I ask them if they would like to pray before their surgery. So belief, knowledge of God, and risk. When you talk about faith, it's not just belief. It's not just a pie in the sky. Uh, it's not just a knowledge of God. It actually involves some risk. So what would Jesus have wanted these disciples to do in this boat? I would say probably the first thing would be pray. He would probably have wanted them to pray. Uh, there are some things that we can do to settle ourselves down, and, w- and, and one of those things is to pray. Another one is to sing. What you sing is actually very good for your brain, but it depends on the lyrics that you're singing. Song is extremely powerful. You, you basically, what you sing becomes your behavior. So as you sing songs that are the kind of person you want to be or what you want to believe. Your brain actually synchronizes. Your left brain, which is sort of more of the words, synchronizes with the right side, which is the melody. And so there's something powerful about singing that helps your behavior. Most of the songs that I listen to in in high school and college, uh, I'm ashamed of now that I would have sung songs. No wonder I had such problems with my behavior and with treating people as obstacles or resources because that is the way our popular music treats them. People are there for you to use and, and for you to be gratified. And right, that is not relational. That's not, most of our songs that we listen to, they're not life-giving. They're taking So... I believe that Jesus wanted them to perhaps try some things, perhaps pray. Or when they woke him up, maybe that he would have liked them to say something like, you know, we need some help. Uh, We believe that you wanted to go to the other side. We've we've tried praying about this storm and it, it doesn't seem to be doing any good. Would you would you help us? There's a different tone. There's a relational tone. Versus, don't you care that we're perishing? Which is an accusatory tone, which is oftentimes how we come to God. God wants us to be relational. Now I want to go to the next, uh, the next story. I'm just going to read it to you. Mark 6:45. This is the second time that they're in a boat in a storm. Mark 6:45. Immediately. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. They just, he just finished feeding the 5,000. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, that is about three in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Matthew 14, 27 adds a little bit of um, additional onto this. 
It says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Well, there's a lot in this passage, but you can see Jesus was with them the first time, sleeping in the back of the boat. Second time, he's not there. If you look at the the language, Mark 6.45, it says he made them get into the boat. In other words, they didn't want to get into the boat. Now, why would they not have wanted to get into the boat? (laughs) They had a bad experience. It's already evening, which means they're going to be rowing in the night. This is 2,000 years ago. There's no electric lights. They're going to be rowing in the dark with 12 guys in that boat. They are not excited about this. They have just seen him do his huge miracle. They have 12 baskets of food that they've picked up. Um, it says in, in another uh, gospel that the people had come since he'd given them this food. They wanted to make Jesus a king by force. And so Jesus had actually come to this place with the disciples to get away because John the Baptist had been beheaded. There's been a tragedy, a national tragedy. They were grieving. So they weren't in good shape, these disciples. Jesus does this incredible miracle. The people love this. And they say, well, John's gone, but this guy, this is our new king. This is the one we've been waiting for. And Jesus, instead of having them camp out there with him in this desolate place, decides, so he makes them, he decides to send them back in the boat while he goes to the mountain to pray. They were not amused. They were not happy, although I imagine they took a basket or two of the food with them in the boat. There they are, the 12 of them in the boat, and a windstorm comes up. And so this trip, which was probably across the Sea of Galilee is eight miles at the longest. This was probably about a five-mile trip they were going to row. They were probably expecting to get there at midnight. Well, this wind comes up, and you're rowing 12 guys. If each of them weighed 100 pounds, you have 1,200 pounds. Somebody's trying to row this against the wind. They are not going very fast. They're tired, probably cold. They might not be hungry because they had some leftovers, but they're not, they're sort of orange. They're not able to sleep on a boat because if you looked at that boat, I mean, there are, there are ribs in there. There might have been some cushions, but because of the wind, the boat is sort of pounding. You can't get comfortable. They're kind of cranky, sort of irritable. And then Jesus comes three, four in the morning. They'd been rowing for eight hours. I want you to imagine yourself in this boat with the other 11 for eight hours. You didn't want to be there. He told you to go. And I want you to think, is there a situation in your life right now where you feel like you're in this boat and you're not getting there? A relationship, a health issue, a financial issue. Maybe you don't even feel like you're rowing because I I, I was thinking, now who do you suppose was rowing? Probably not Matthew, the tax collector. It was probably Peter, right? One of the fishermen were probably rowing. They were used to rowing these boats, but really with only two or three guys in them, not with 12. So probably Peter was rowing. And so one of the takeaways I got from this passage was, if you're going to be in the boat for eight hours, try to be the one rowing. And the reason is when Jesus shows up, he's the only one that seems to be relational. The rest of them were probably sitting there with their coats over them, trying to stay warm. They were not relational. Jesus was just, uh, was he a resource to help them get home? They just wanted to go to bed. They just wanted to go to sleep. 
Peter's the only one that saw, well, maybe there's a relational or something relational I can do here. As I meditated on this passage, I thought, well, what do you think Jesus really wanted them to do or even wanted Peter to do? I believe that he wanted Peter to say, hey, guys, let's all go and walk on the water. Let's all go. There's probably a reasonable chance if they were all out there, he might not have fallen in. Because if you think about trying to walk on water, were you walking up over each wave or was it like when you stand in the ocean, the waves sort of wash over your knees and ankles? Have you ever thought about that? What, what exactly was happening here? The technical aspects of walking on a water in a storm, I mean, on a pool is one thing, but this is a storm. So even the, even the balance required to do that is something that Peter hadn't practiced. But probably Peter, along with each of those guys, thought that every other person in the boat was just an obstacle, just weighing the boat down, preventing them from getting where they wanted to go. And you see this later on in Peter's life when Jesus says, uh, you're all going to betray me. And Peter says, what does he say? They may all betray you, but I will not. Again, not thinking about the others. And then finally, when, when Peter denies him three times and Jesus corrects him then, he tells him, Peter, do you love me? And he says, feed my lambs. Second time, feed my sheep or shepherd my sheep. And then again, feed my sheep. What is he telling him? Be life-giving to the people around you. Peter, you're not life-giving. You're only thinking about you and, and, and your goals. I want you to be life-giving I'm giving you those people around you. You shepherd them. You feed them. I remember a time when I was called at three in the morning to go see a patient. I was woken. And even though it is our responsibility, I was not in a good mood. I drove to the hospital. And sure enough, there was the patient. He'd had a hemorrhage. His wife was next to him. And I was not particularly relational. I told him all about aneurysm surgery. It's very dangerous. You could go blind. You could die. You could have seizures. Um, And even if that goes well, the blood in your brain could kill you. And I was basically uh, just telling them all the risks of surgery. And I remember the wife stood up, and she was in a wheelchair. She stood up, and she said, Doctor, is there any good news? (laughs) In other words, all that bad news I had while I was at home, I was actually expecting some good news now that I'm at the hospital. And that was all it took to wake me up. My relational circuits weren't on, and suddenly they were on. Did you say good news? Well, the good news is that you got him to the hospital because 30% of people with aneurysms never actually make it to the hospital. But the best news, the really good news, is that God is with him. Do you have any faith or religion? Well, we're, we're Catholic. Well, the good news is that we can pray for him. And so we prayed for him, and then... I saw that his wife was in a wheelchair, and she was a a very large woman. And I said, why are you in the the wheelchair? And she said, well, I have a bad knee. I'm going to have to have surgery on it. I said, how bad is the pain on a scale of 1 to 10? She said, it's 10 over 10. I said, well, how about we pray for you? Could I pray for you? She said, sure. So I put my hand on her knee, and I prayed for her knee. And she looked up at me and she said, I, I felt something sort of come off of my knee and it doesn't hurt anymore. Well, I hadn't seen that before. <laughs> and so I went home. It's, you know, now four in the morning. I, I, I saw them as obstacles for me getting to sleep and God was doing something if I would just wake up. 
And I want you to think right now, I want to give you a few moments for you to think about your storms, whatever it is that you're going through. And I want you to, to think about how relational are you with God right now? Because when we're in pain, we're usually not very relational. And I want you to give you a, a few, maybe 30 seconds here. I want, I want you to turn your relational circuits back on. I want you to start talking to God about the pain. He doesn't mind. He has very big shoulders. You can tell him that you feel like you've been abandoned or betrayed or uh, he doesn't care or he's sleeping. You tell him whatever you want, but you get relational. Honesty is the basis of any good relationship. It starts with honesty. I recommend respect, but let's just spend 30 seconds or a minute talking with God about where you are and relating to him and asking for what you want if you need to. All right. I encourage that kind of relational interaction with God. We ask him for things when we're in trouble, but to to relate to him is something that I believe is what Jesus is looking for. I want to bless you. I am a descendant of the tribe of Levi. And for those of you who know the, the, the scriptures in the Old Testament, the Levites were the priests. And in Numbers chapter 6, God told Moses to tell Aaron and the priest to bless the people this way. He said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make its face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And when he said that, most of us have heard that before and we think it's just sort of a nice poem. But they were in a wilderness. They were in the desert. They weren't slaves. They'd come out of Egypt, but they were in a desert counting on God, relying on him every day for for the food that would arrive. They were not in the promised land. They weren't even sure when or if they were going to get there. And if some of you can relate to that, then this means a little more to you. And the Hebrew is actually very short. It's something like, I, your God, I'm blessing you. Can you see it? Do you understand that I'm blessing you? Have, you? have you noticed? I know you're focused on what you don't have. Have you noticed the blessings that I have been giving you? That maybe you can see or you can walk and all the people that can't. You take so much for granted. You live in Southern California. Have you noticed that I'm blessing you? And my job is to continue blessing you. That's my, my job and I take that job seriously. And to keep you, to protect you. I've been protecting you. Have you noticed that? And my face, I will make my face shine upon you. And it's, when you talk about God's face shining, we sort of see that spotlight shining down. But it's more like the shining face that you show when your three-year-old comes running up to you. You light up. God's saying, I light up when I see you. And I see you all the time. And I'm gracious to you. I give you what you don't deserve. My countenance lights up. It's the same word, face. My face, if you think it's down, I will lift it up when you come around because I've been waiting for you to come around. Because I want you to have peace. Because when you have peace, when you're in the storm, when you're in the boat rowing for eight hours and you're getting tired, I want you to have peace that I do care, and I am with you. And I just bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.